The other thing that's very important is to recognize the problem of food. We live in a completely unjust food system. In America, because sugar can be produced much cheaper in places, they put all of these restrictions on the importation of sugar. And so Americans now are eating corn syrup produced in America and getting fat from this corn syrup. Because corn syrup is actually not a good source of sugar. That's an example, but I'll give you a worse example. The most important study that's been done on nutrition ever is the China study by Dr. Campbell and his researchers. This was a first-rate researcher from Harvard, teamed up uh, from Princeton, teamed up with Oxford. He was a completely credible scientist. And Premier Deng in China died of cancer of the bladder. Before he died, he set aside money to do a study of nutrition in China and disease relation. So this was independently funded. Campbell ran that team, and the result of it is the China study. Some things about the China study that are very important. The first thing is that the results were so radical that the food pyramid was changed to be more scientific. But because meat and dairy were completely minimized in the diet, the, the meat and dairy industry in the United States lobbied so hard that they actually changed the pyramid, which means science is no longer serving humanity, it's serving corporate interests. That's what it means. Science is serving corporate interests. That is wrong. In the China study, what they found is that in areas where their protein was less than 5% from meat and dairy, there was no cancer. There was no cancer. The original study was done in Hyderabad in India. And the Harvard scientists, they laughed at it, and they said, oh, they must have got the cages mixed up. Campbell replicated this science repeatedly. Some things about meat and dairy consumption. First of all, the meat and dairy today is not the meat and dairy that grandma and grandpa ate. The meat that grandma and grandpa ate were free range, what they would call now organic. They, weren't, they didn't have a word for it because everything was organic 50 years ago. Organic, free range, happily raised animals on farms where they actually treated animals with some dignity. Farmers actually had relationships with their animals. They treated them with dignity. Now, and I, I, my grandfather had a cattle ranch, so I actually spent my summers on a cattle ranch, and I herded cattle, and I saw. My grandfather, the first time I got on a horse, before I got on the horse, he put a, a pencil in my mouth and yanked it back really hard. And he said, that's what the horse feels when you're using that bit, so don't forget it. That was my first lesson. Because that's the way people taught. They had respect for their animals. In the United States, horses are not categorized as pets. They're categorized as livestock. You can starve a horse to death in America and not go to jail, which is wrong. Horses should have rights. Animals have rights in Islam. This is not a new concept. Our religion gives animals rights. Ants have rights. In the book of Zuhd, one of the Sahaba used to go out and put breadcrumbs on the ant hill that was near his house. And one of, some, one of the tabi'een asked him what he was doing. He said, I don't want them testifying against me on Yom Qiyamah that I didn't fulfill the rights of the neighbor. I mean, this is an anthill. What kind of psychology did these people have? It's a different world they were living in. Dr. Nasser was alluding to it last night. They lived in a different world. The Prophet spoke to animals. He spoke to animals. Our Prophet spoke to animals. He spoke to them, and they spoke back to him. This is not mythology. This is reality. We have people today that still speak to animals. Animals respond to you. They respond to you. They're sentient creatures. They have nervous systems. They feel pain. They become depressed. In America, we have dogs and cats on Prozac. This is a fact. Veterinarians prescribe Prozac for dogs in America. Don't think the dog is depressed because he's a dog. He's happy to be a dog. He's depressed because he's in a house that's depressing. The, the, dog, whisperer, the dog whisperer said, the dog whisperer said, he doesn't go solve people's dog problems. He goes and solves dogs' people problems. 
And the same is true for the horse whisperer, Buck. The horse whisperer said, I don't solve people's horse problems. I solve horses' people problems. Animals are intuitive. They know when something's wrong. Sayyidina Omar, during his Khalifa, prohibited eating meat every day. This is a fact. Also, don't think vegetarianism is not from Islam. People say that when they become Muslim and they're vegetarian, they say, oh, you have to stop eating meat. I mean, you have to start eating meat. Your iman's not complete until you eat meat. That's what they say. And then they give them the biryani and welcome to Islam. <laughs> Ibn Abi Laham, one of the Sahaba, Ibn Abi Laham was a vegetarian. Kana Nabatiyan, this is in the, the tradition. And the Prophet accepted that from him. Now, if you swore off meat for ibadah, that's a different thing. The Prophet told them not to do that. But he didn't want to eat meat. Maybe he didn't like it. But today, meeting, eating a lot of meat is unethical. I would say that eating fish, this is your choice, and I'm not dictating to anybody. You have to make your own choices. You do your research. You know, we're not fascists. Think for yourselves. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to, to make you think about things. And you go back and you do your own research and you decide for yourselves because you're all sovereign human beings and nobody can tell you what to do other than Allah and His Messenger, and that's it. Nobody can tell you what to do. And every scholar that tells you, he's telling you what he thinks Allah and His Messenger is telling you what to do. That's called ishtihad. But there are a few things where Allah spells it out. And fallibilism is very important. Our scholars need to have more fallibilism. We don't doubt Islam, but we should doubt our understanding of Islam. We should doubt our understanding of Islam. We don't doubt Islam, but we should doubt our understanding of Islam. Because to, to have certainty about your understanding is to arrogate to yourself some divine knowledge that you don't have. So Sayyidina Omar said, It's in the Muwatta. Beware of meat because it has, it has an addiction like the addiction of wine. Beware of meat. Because it has an addiction like the addiction of wine. We have Muslims now eating meat three times a day, and then they're wondering why they have gout, why they have all these diseases. Seriously, start cutting that out. The other thing, I read a book last year called The Caveman's Diet, and in that book, he was arguing, this is not even, he's not a Muslim, he said everybody should fast at least a month out of the year where they diminish their, this is what he said in his book, he's from LA. Everybody should fast a month out of the year and fast a couple of days in the month. Because he said our bodies are designed to be food deprived. They're designed that way, to be food deprived. They're, if you want to see an amazing documentary, look at sick, fat, and nearly dead. Sick, fat, and nearly dead. And you look at the miracle that happens on that. A man who fasted 60 days and then got another man who was almost dead to start fasting and the man's transformation was amazing. We need to transform our food. We need to eat healthy food that's locally grown. We need, if we're going to eat meat, you shouldn't eat meat more than once a day, once a week. Imam Sahara Tusturi, one of the conditions when he took on students, one of the conditions he stipulated was they only ate meat once a week. In Maliki Fiqh, a rich woman is entitled to meat twice a week. Muslims were semi-vegetarians. The Prophet ﷺ was a semi-vegetarian. He did not eat a lot of meat. This is a fact. You can read it in the seerah. Two months they would see no smoke came out of his chimney. And they would say, what were you eating? They said, al-aswadain. It's in the Sahih collection. Al-aswadain, water and dates. Dates are one of the most beneficial foods in the world. So this is absolutely imperative that you change your diets. We're eating far too much processed foods. All of this cancer, one out of four people is getting cancer now. Heart disease, diabetes, 70% of people in some of the Gulf states over 40 have type 2 diabetes, 70%. They're drinking, eating all this processed food. Cancer has become epidemic in, in West Africa because they're eating all these processed foods. Eat fresh, healthy foods. Eat good foods. This is part of our religion. Allah doesn't mention food without mentioning halal and tayyib. Make your food a source of nutrition. Don't eat empty food. Don't eat too much food. Really, eat twice a day. Sahal was asked, 
He said, what do you say about a man who eats once a day? He said, Akul al-Anbiya, that's the way the prophets eat. He said, what about twice a day? He said, Akul al-Sadiqeen. He said, that's the way the righteous eat. And then he said, what about three times a day? He said, build for them a trough. Build for them a trough.